Chapter Eight of the Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter Eight. Hesitation. Mr. Waddington called a taxicab. I can't stand the Golden Lion any more. He explained. Somehow or other, the place seems to have changed in the most extraordinary manner during the last week or so. Everybody drinks too much there. The table linen isn't clean, and the barmaids are too familiar. I found out a little place in German Street where I go now when I have time. We can talk there. Burton nodded. He was, as a matter of fact, intensely interested. Only a few weeks ago, his late employer had spent nearly every moment of his time, when his services were not urgently required at the office, at the Golden Lion, and he had been seen on more than one occasion at the theatre and elsewhere, with one or another of the golden-haired ladies behind the bar. Mr. Waddington, fortunately, perhaps, considering his present predicament, was a bachelor. The restaurant, if small, was an excellent one, and Mr. Waddington, who seemed already to be treated with the consideration of a regular customer, ordered a luncheon which, simple though it was, inspired his companion with respect. The waiter withdrew, and the auctioneer and his quondam clerk sat and looked at one another. Their eyes were full of questions. Mr. Waddington made a bad lapse. "'What in hell do you suppose it all means, Burton?' he demanded. "'You see, I've got it, too.' "'Obviously,' Burton answered. "'I am sure,' he added a little hesitatingly, "'that I congratulate you.' Mr. Waddington at that moment looked scarcely a subject for congratulation. A spasm as though of pain had suddenly passed across his face. He clutched at the side of his chair. "'It's marvellous, he murmured. "'A single word like that, and I suffer in an absolutely indescribable sort of way. "'There seems to be something pulling at me all the time.' even when it rises to my lips. "'I shouldn't worry about that,' Burton replied. "'You must get out of the habit. It's quite easy. I expect very soon you will find all desire to use strong language has disappeared entirely.' Mr. Waddington was inclined to be gloomy. "'That's all very well,' he declared, "'but I've my living to get.' "'You seem to be doing pretty well up to now,' Burton reminded him. Mr. Waddington assented, but without enthusiasm. "'It can't last, Burton,' he said. I am ashamed to say it, but all my crowd have got so accustomed to hear me, er, uh, exaggerate, that they disbelieve everything I say as a matter of habit. I tell them now that the goods I am offering are not what they should be, because I can't help it, and they think it's because I have some deep game up my sleeve, or because I do not want to part. I give them a week or so at the most, Burton, no more. Don't you think, Burton suggested doubtfully, that there might be an opening in the profession for an auctioneer who told the truth? Mr. Waddington smiled sadly. "'That's absurd, Burton,' he replied, "'and you know it.' Burton considered the subject thoughtfully. "'There must be occupations,' he murmured, "'where instinctive truthfulness would be an advantage. "'I can't think of one,' Mr. Waddington answered gloomily. "'Besides, I am too old for anything absolutely new.' "'How on earth did you succeed in letting Idlemay's house?' Burton asked suddenly. "'Most remarkable instant,' his host declared. Reminds me of my last two sales of antique furniture. This man, a Mr. Forrester, came to me with his wife, very keen to take a house in that precise neighbourhood. I asked him the lowest rent to start with, and I told him that the late owner had died of typhoid there, and that the drains had practically not been touched since. And yet he took it, took it within twenty-four hours. Mr. Waddington continued. He seemed to like the way I put it to him and instead of being scared he went to an expert in drains who advised him that there was only quite a small thing wrong he's doing up some of the rooms and moving in in a fortnight this sounds as though there might be an opening for an honest house agent burton suggested mr waddington looked dubious it's never been tried just this once it came off but as a regular thing i should have no confidence in it people like to be gulled they've been brought up to it they ask for lies. That's why the world's so full of them. Case of supply and demand, you know. According to you, then, Burton remarked a little dolefully, it seems as though this change in us unfits us for any sort of practical life. Mr. Waddington coughed. Even his cough was no longer strident. That, he confessed, has been worrying me. I find it hard to see the matter differently. If one might venture upon a somewhat personal question, 
how did you manage to discover a vocation you seem to be prospering he added glancing at his companion's neat clothes and grey silk tie i was fortunate burton admitted frankly i discovered quite by accident the one form in which it is possible to palm off the truth on an unsuspecting public mr waddington laid down his knife and fork he was intensely interested art burton murmured softly art mr waddington echoed under his breath a little vaguely the questioning gleam was still in his eyes painting sculpture in my case writing burton explained i read something when i was half starving which was in a newspaper and had obviously been paid for and i saw at once that the only point about it was that the man had put down what he saw instead of what he thought he saw i tried the same thing and up to the present at any rate it seems to go quite well that's queer mr waddington murmured do you know he continued dropping his voice and looking around him anxiously that i've taken to reading ruskin i've got a copy of the seven lamps at the office and i can't keep away from it i slip it into my drawer if any one comes in like an office boy reading the police gazette all the time i am in the streets i am looking at the buildings and burton this is the extraordinary part of it i know no more about architecture than a babe unborn and yet i can tell you where they're wrong every one of them there are some streets i can't pass through and i close my eyes whenever i get near buckingham palace on the other hand i walked a mile the other day to see a perfect arch down in south kensington and there are some new masonettes in queen anne street without a single erring line burton poured himself out a glass of wine from the bottle which his companion had ordered mr waddington he said this is a queer thing that has happened to us not a soul would believe it the auctioneer assented no one would ever believe it the person who declared that there was nothing new under the sun evidently knew nothing about these beans burton leaned across the table mr waddington he continued i was around at idle may's house this morning i went to see what had become of the flower-pot i found the little room swept bare one of the workmen told me that the things had been stolen mr waddington showed some signs of embarrassment he waited for his companion to proceed i wanted the rest of those beans burton confessed mr waddington shook his head slowly i haven't made my mind up about them yet he said better leave them alone you know where they are then burton demanded breathlessly the auctioneer did not deny it i had them removed he explained in a somewhat peculiar fashion the fact of it is the new tenant is a very peculiar man and i did not dare to ask him to give me that little tree i simply did not dare to run the risk it is a painful subject with me this because quite thoughtlessly i endeavoured to assume the appearance of anger on discovering the theft the words nearly stuck in my throat and i was obliged to lie down for an hour afterwards burton drew a little breath of relief i wish i had asked you about this before he declared i should have enjoyed my luncheon better mr waddington coughed the beans he remarked are in my possession there are only eleven of them and i have not yet made up my mind exactly what to do with them mr waddington burton said impressively have you forgotten that i am a married man mr waddington started god bless my soul he exclaimed i had forgotten that a wife and one little boy burton continued we were all living at garden green in a small plastered edifice called clematis villa my wife is a vigorous woman part of whose life has been spent in domestic service and part in a suburban dressmaker's establishment she keeps the house very clean pins up the oleographs presented to us at christmas time by the grocer and the oilman and thinks i look genteel in a silk hat when we walk out to hear the band in the public gardens on thursday evenings i can see her mr waddington groaned my poor fellow she cuts out her own clothes burton continued from patterns presented by a lady's penny paper she trims her own hats with an inheritance of feathers which in their day have known every colour of the rainbow she loves strong perfumes and she is strenuous on the subject of primary colours we have a tablecloth with fringed borders for tea on sunday afternoons she hates flowers because they mess up the room so but she adorns our parlour with wool-work mementos artificial roses under a glass case and crockery neatly inscribed with the name of some seaside place mr waddington wiped the perspiration from his forehead and produced a small silver casket from his waistcoat pocket stop i beg you win i can see what you are aiming at here is a bean burton waved it away listen he proceeded 
I have also a child, a little son. His name is Alfred. He is called Alf for short. His mother greases his hair, and he has a curl which comes over his forehead. I have never known him when his hands were not both sticky and dirty. His hands and his lips. On holidays he wears a velveteen suit with grease spots inked over, an imitation lace collar, and a blue make-up tie. Mr. Waddington reopened the silver casket. It is fate, he decided. Here are two beans. Burton folded them up in a piece of paper and placed them carefully in his waistcoat pocket. I felt convinced, he said gratefully, that I should not make my appeal to you in vain. Tell me, what do you think of doing with the rest? I am not sure, Mr. Waddington admitted after a brief pause. We are confronted from the beginning with the fact that there isn't a living soul who would believe our story. If we tried to publish it, people would only look upon it as an inferior sort of fiction, and declare that the idea had been used before. I thought of having one of the beans resolved into its constituents by a scientific physician, but I doubt if I'd get any one to treat the matter seriously. Of course, he went on, if there were any quantity of the beans, so that we could prove the truth of our statements upon any one who professed to doubt them, we might be able to put them to some practical use. At present, he concluded with a little sigh, I really can't think of any. When one considers, Burton remarked, the number of people in high positions who might have discovered these beans and profited by them, it does rather appear as though they had been wasted upon an auctioneer and an auctioneer's clerk, who have to get their livings. I entirely agree with you, Mr. Waddington assented. I must admit that in some respects I feel happier, and life seems a much more interesting place. Yet I can't altogether escape from certain apprehensions as regards the future. If you take my advice, Burton said firmly, you'll continue the business exactly as you are doing at present. I have no idea of abandoning it, Mr. Waddington replied. The trouble is, how long will it be before it abandons me? I have a theory of my own as to that, Burton declared. We will not talk about it at present. Simply wait and see. Mr. Waddington paid the bill. Meanwhile, he said, you had better get down to Garden Green as quickly as you can. You will excuse me if I hurry off? It is almost time to start the sale again. Burton followed his host into the street. The sun was shining, and a breath of perfume from the roses in a woman's gown assailed him, as she passed by on the threshold to enter the restaurant. He stood quite still for a moment. He had succeeded in his object. He had acquired the beans which were to restore to him his domestic life, and in place of any sense of satisfaction he was conscious of an intense sense of depression. What magic, after all, could change Ellen? He forgot for one moment the gulf across which he had so miraculously passed. He thought of himself as he was now, and of Ellen as she had been. The memory of that visit to Garden Green seemed suddenly like a nightmare. The memory of the train, underground for part of the way, with its stuffy odours, made him shiver. The hot, dusty, unmade street with its hideous row of stuccoed villas loomed before his eyes and confirmed his swiftly born disinclination to take at once this final and ominous step. Something all the time seemed to be drawing him in another direction, the faint magic of a fragrant memory. A dream, was it, that he had carried with him unconsciously through a wilderness of empty days? He hesitated and finally climbed up on the garden seat of an omnibus on its way to Victoria. End of chapter 8、chapter、nine of the Double Life of Alfred Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Blaine Jewshaw. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter 9 The Land of Enchantment. I do not think, the girl with the blue eyes said diffidently, that I gave you permission to sit down here. I do not believe, Burton admitted, that I asked for it. Still, having just saved your life, saved my life, without a doubt, Burton insisted firmly. She laughed in his face. When she laughed, she was good to look upon. She had firm white teeth, light brown hair, which Fell 
in a sort of fringe about her forehead, and eyes which could be dreamy, but were more often humorous. She was not tall, and she was inclined to be slight, but her figure was lithe, full of beautiful spring and reach. "'You drove away a cow!' she exclaimed. "'It's only because I am rather idiotic about cows that I happen to be afraid. I am sure that it was a perfectly harmless animal.' "'On the contrary,' he assured her seriously, "'there was something in the eye of that cow which almost inspired me with fear. Did you notice the way it lashed its tail?' "'Absurd!' At least, he protested, you cannot find it absurd that I prefer to sit here with you in the shadow of your lilac trees to trudging any further along that dusty road. You haven't the slightest right to be here at all, she reminded him. I didn't even invite you to come in. He sighed. Women have so little sense of consequence, he murmured. When you came in through that gate without saying goodbye, I naturally concluded that I was expected to follow especially as you had just pointed this out to me as being your favorite seat. Again she laughed. Then she stopped suddenly and looked at him. He really was a somewhat difficult person to place. If I hadn't a very irritable parent to consider, she declared, I think I should ask you to tea. Burton looked very sad. You need not have put it into my head, he objected gently. The inn smells so horribly of the beer that other people have drunk. Besides, I have come such a long way, just for a glimpse of you. It seemed to her like a false note. She frowned. That, she insisted, is ridiculous. Is it? he murmured. Don't you ever, when you walk in your gardens with only that low wall between you and the road, wonder whether any of those who pass may not carry away a little vision with them. It's a beautiful setting, you know. The people who pass by are few, she answered. We are far too off the beaten path. Only on Saturdays and holiday times there are trippers, fearful creatures who pick the bracken, walk arm in arm, and sing songs. Tell me why you look as though you were dreaming, my preserver. Look along the lane, he said softly. Can't you see them? The wagonette, with the tired horse drawn up just on the common there. A tired, dejected-looking horse, with a piece of bracken tied onto his head to keep the flies off. There were three men, two women, and a little boy. They drank beer and ate sandwiches behind that gorse bush there. They called one another by their Christian names. They shouted loud personal jokes. One of the women sang. She wore a large hat with dyed feathers. She had black, untidy-looking hair, and her face was red. One of the men made a noise with his lips as an accompaniment. There was the little boy, too, a pasty-faced little boy with a curl on his forehead, who cried because he had eaten too much. One of the men sat some distance apart from the others and stared at you. Stared at you for quite a long time. I remember it perfectly, she declared. It was last Whit Monday. Hateful people they were, all of them. But how did you know? I saw nobody else pass by. I was there, he whispered. And I never saw you, she exclaimed in wonder. I remember those bank holiday people, though, how abominable they were. You saw me, he insisted gently. I was the one who sat apart and stared. "'Of course you're talking rubbish,' she asserted uneasily. He shook his head. "'I was behind the banks, the banks of cloud, you know.' He went on a little wistfully. "'I think that that was one of the few moments in my life when I peered out of my prison house. I must have known what was coming. I must have remembered afterwards, for I came here.' She looked at him doubtfully. Her eyes were very blue, and he looked into them steadfastly. By degrees the lines at the sides of her mouth began to quiver. "'Why, that person was abominable,' she declared. "'He stared right at me as though I were something unreal. He'd taken off his coat and rolled up his shirt-sleeves. 
he had on bright yellow boots and a hateful necktie. Phew, indeed. I would as soon believe, she concluded, that you had fallen today from a flying machine. Let us believe that, he begged earnestly. Why not? Indeed, in a sense, it is true. I'm cut adrift from my kind, a stroller through life, a vagabond without any definite place or people. I'm trying to teach myself the simplest forms of philosophy. Today the sky is so blue and the wind blows from the west and the sun is just hot enough to draw the perfume from the gorse and the heather. Come and walk with me over the moors. We will race the shadows, for surely we can move quicker than those fleecy little morsels of clouds. Certainly not, she retorted, with a firmness which was suspiciously emphasized. I couldn't think of walking anywhere with a person whom I didn't know, and besides, I have to go and make tea in a few minutes. He looked over her shoulder and sighed. A trim parlour-maid was busy arranging a small table under the cedar tree. Tea, he murmured. It is unfortunate. Not at all, she replied sharply. If you'd behave like a reasonable person for five minutes, I might ask you to stay. A little instruction, he pleaded. I'm really quite apt. My apparent stupidity is only misleading. You may be, as you say, a vagabond and an outcast and all that sort of thing, but this is a conventional English home, the girl with the blue eyes declared. And I am a perfectly well-behaved young woman with an absent-minded but strict parent. I could not think of asking anyone to tea of whose very name I was ignorant. He pointed to the afternoon paper which lay at her feet. I sign myself there a passer-by. My real name is Burton. Until lately I was an auctioneer's clerk. Now I'm a drifter. What you will. You wrote those impressions of St. James Park at dawn? She asked eagerly. I did. She smiled a smile of relief. Of course. I knew that you were a reasonable person, she pronounced. Why couldn't you have said so at once? Come along to tea. "'Willingly,' he replied, rising to his feet. "'Is this your father coming across the lawn?' She nodded. "'He's rather a dear. Do you know anything about Assyria?' "'Not a scrap.' "'That's a pity,' she regretted. "'Come, father, this is Mr. Burton. He's very hot, and he's going to have tea with us. And he wrote those impressions on the Piccadilly Gazette, which you gave me to read.' My father is an Oriental scholar, Mr. Burton, but he's also interested in modern things. Burton held out his hand. I try to understand, he said. It is enough for me. I know nothing about Assyria. Mr. Cowper was a picturesque-looking old gentleman with kind blue eyes and long white hair. It's quite natural, he assented. You were born in London, without a doubt. You've lived there all your days, and you write as one who sees. I was born in a library. I saw no city till I entered college. I had fashioned cities for myself long before then, and dwelt in them. The girl had taken her place at the tea-table, Burton's eyes following her admiringly. You were brought up in the country? he asked his host. I was born in the city of strange imaginings, Mr. Cowper replied. I read and read until I had learned the real art of fancy. No one who has ever learned it needs to look elsewhere for a dwelling-house. It's the realism of your writing which fascinates me so, Mr. Burton. I wish you would stay here and write of my guard. The moorland, too, is beautiful. I should like to very much, said Burton. Mr. Cowper gazed at him in mild curiosity. You're a stranger to me, Mr. Burton, he remarked. My daughter does not often encourage visitors. Pray tell me, how did you make her acquaintance? There was a bull, he commenced. A cow, she interrupted softly. On the moor outside, your daughter was a little terrified. She accepted my escort after I had driven away the animal. The old gentleman looked as though he thought it the most natural thing in the world. Dear me, he said, how interesting. Edith, the strawberries this afternoon are delicious. 
you must show Mr. Uh, Mr. Burton our kitchen gardens. Our south wall is famous. This was the whole miracle of how Alfred Burton, whose first appearance in the neighborhood had been as an extremely objectionable tripper, was accepted almost as one of the family in a most exclusive little household. Edith, cool and graceful, sitting back in her wicker chair behind the daintily laid tea-table, seemed to take it all for granted. Mr. Cowper, after rambling on for some time, made an excuse and departed through the French windows of his library. Afterwards, Burton walked with his young hostess in the old-fashioned walled garden. She treated him with the easy informality of privileged intimacy. She had accepted him as belonging, notwithstanding his damaging statements as to his antecedents, and he walked by the side of his divinity without trace of awkwardness or nervousness. This world of truth was indeed a world of easy ways. The garden was fragrant with perfumes, the perfume of full-blown roses, great pink and yellow and white blossoms, drooping in clusters from trees and bushes, of lavender from an ancient bed, of stocks, pink and purple, of sweetbriar, growing in a hedge beyond. They walked aimlessly about along the gravel paths and crossed the deep greensward, and Burton knew no world nor thought of any, save the world of that garden. But the girl, when they reached the boundary, leaned over the iron gate and her eyes were fixed northward. It was the old story. She sighed for life and he for beauty. The walls of her prison house were beautiful things, but not even the lichen and the moss and the peaches, which already hung amber and red behind the thick leaves, could ever make her wholly forget that they were, in a sense, symbolical, the walls of her life. To live here, he murmured, must be like living in paradise. She sighed. There was a little wistful droop about her lips. Her eyes were still fixed northwards. I should like, he said, to tell you a fairy story. It's about a wife and a little boy. "'Whose wife?' she asked quickly. "'Mine,' he replied. There was a brief silence. A shadow had passed across her face. She was very young, and really very unsophisticated, and it may be that already the idea had presented itself, however faintly, that his might be the voice to call her into the promised land. Certain it is that after that silence some glory seemed to have passed from the summer evening. It's a fairy story, and yet it is true, he went on, almost humbly. Somehow, no one will believe it. Will you try? I will try, she promised. Afterwards, he held the two beans in the palm of his hand, and she turned them over curiously. Tell me again what your wife is like, she asked. He told her the pitiless truth, and then there was a long silence. As he stood before her, a little breath of wind passed over the garden. He came back from the world of sordid places to the land of enchantment. There was certainly some spell upon him. He had found his way into a garden which lay beyond the world. He was conscious all at once of a strange mixture of spicy perfumes, a faint sense of intoxication, of weird, delicate emotions which caught at the breath in his throat and sent the blood dancing through his veins, warmed to a new and wonderful music. Her blue eyes were a little dimmed, the droop of her head a little sad. Quite close to them was a thick bed of lavender. He looked at the beans in his hand, and his eyes sought the thickest part of the clustering mass of foliage and blossom. She had lifted her eyes now, and it seemed to him that she had divined his purpose, approved of it even. Her slim, white-clad body swayed towards him. She appeared to have abandoned finally the faint aloofness of her attitude. He raised his hand. Then she stopped him. The moment, whatever its dangers may have been, had passed. "'I do not know whether your story is an allegory or not,' she said softly. "'It really doesn't matter, does it?' 
you must come and see me again afterwards. End of chapter 9 Recorded by Blaine Chapter 10 of The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Blaine. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter 10 No Reconciliation. Burton travelled down to Garden Green on the following morning by the tube, which he hated, and walked along the familiar avenue with loathing at his heart. There was no doubt about Ellen's being home. The few feet of backyard were full of white garments of unlovely shape, recently washed and fluttering in the breeze. The very atmosphere was full of soap suds. Ellen herself opened the door to him, her skirts pinned up around her, and a clothes-peg in her mouth. He greeted her with an effort at pleasantness. "'Good morning, Ellen,' he said. "'I'm glad to find you at home. May I come in?' Ellen removed the clothes-peg from her mouth. "'It's her own house, isn't it?' she replied, with a suspicious little quiver in her tone. "'I don't suppose you've forgotten your way to the end of the parlour. Keep well away from me, or you may get some soap suds in your fine clothes.' She raised her red arms above her head and flattened herself against the wall with elaborate care. Burton, hating himself and the whole situation, stepped into the parlor. Ellen followed him as far as the threshold. "'What is it you want?' she demanded, still retaining one foot in the passage. "'I'm busy. You haven't forgotten that it's Friday morning, have you?' "'I want to talk to you for a little while,' he said gently. "'I have something to propose which may improve our relations.' Ellen's attitude became one of fierce contempt, mingled with a slight tremulousness. "'Such ridiculous goings-on and ways of speaking,' she muttered. "'Well, if you have anything to say to me, you'll have to wait a bit, that's all. I've got some clothes I can't leave all in a scurry like this. I'll send Alf in to keep you company.' Burton sighed, but accepted his fate. For a few moments he sat upon the sofa and gazed around at the hopeless little room. Then, in due course, the door was pushed open and Alfred appeared, his hair shiny, his cheeks redolent of recent ablutions, more than a trifle reluctant. His conversation was limited to a few monosyllables and a whoop of joy at the receipt of a shilling. His efforts at escape afterwards were so pitiful that Burton eventually let him out of the window, from which he disappeared, running at full tilt towards a confectioner's shop. Presently Ellen returned. It was exceedingly manifest that her temporary absence had not been wholly due to the exigencies of her domestic occupation. Her skirt was unpinned. A mauve bow adorned her throat. A scarf of some gauzy material, also mauve, floated around her neck. She was wearing a hat with a wig, which she was guiltily conscious of having once admired, and which she attempted, in an airy but exceedingly unconvincing fashion, to explain. "'Got to go up the street directly,' she said jerkily. "'What is it?' Burton had made up his mind that the fewer words he employed, the better. "'Ellen,' he began, "'you have perhaps noticed a certain change in me during the last few weeks?' Ellen's bosom began to heave and her eyes to flash. Burton hastened on. "'You will find it hard to believe how it all occurred,' he continued. "'I want you to, though, if you can. There have been many instances of diet influencing morals, but none quite—' "'Diet doing what?' Ellen broke in. "'What's that?' Burton came very straight to the point. "'This change in me,' he explained simply, "'is merely because I have taken something which makes it impossible for me to say or see anything but the absolute truth. I could not tell you a falsehood if I tried. Wherever I look, or whenever I listen, I can always see or hear truth. I know nothing about music, yet since this thing happened, it has been a wonderful joy to me. I can tell a false note in a second, 
I can tell true music from false. I know nothing about art, yet I can suddenly feel it and all its marvels. You can understand a little, perhaps, what this means? A whole new world, full of beautiful objects and inspirations, has suddenly come into my life. Ellen stared at him blankly. "'Have you gone dotty, Alfred?' she murmured. He shook his head. "'No,' he replied gently. "'If anything, I'm a great deal wiser than I ever was before. Only there are penalties. It's about these penalties that I want to talk to you.' Ellen's arms became crooked and her knuckles were screwed into her waist. It was an unfortunate and inherited habit of hers which reappeared frequently under circumstances of emotion. "'Will you answer this one question?' she insisted. "'Why has all this made you leave your wife at home? Tell me that, will you?' Burton went for his last fence gallantly. "'Because our life here is hideous,' he declared, "'and I can't stand it. Our house is ugly, our furniture impossible, the neighborhood atrocious.' Your clothes are all wrong, and so are Alfred's. I could not possibly live here any longer in the way we have been living up to now. Ellen gave a little gasp. Then what are you doing here now? I cannot come back to you, he continued. I want you to come to me. This is the part of my story which will sound miraculous, if not ridiculous to you, but you will have to take my word for it. Try and remember for a moment that there are things in life beyond the pale of our knowledge, things which we must accept simply by faith. The change which came to me came through eating a sort of bean, grown by an old man who was brought home from Asia by a great scholar. These beans are supposed to contain the germ of truth. I have two here, one for you and one for Alfred. I want you to eat them, and afterwards... What I hope and believe is that we shall see things more the same way and come together again. He produced the beans from his pocket, and Ellen took a step forward. The shortness of her breath and the glitter in her eyes should have warned him. The greatness of his subject, however, had carried him away. His attention was riveted upon the beans lying in the palm of his hand. He looked at them almost reverently. "'Are those the things?' she demanded. He held them out towards her. A faint pang of regret stirred in his heart. For a single second the picture of a beautiful garden glowed and faded before his eyes. A wave of delicious perfume came and went. The girl, slim, white-clad, looked at him a little wistfully with her sad blue eyes. It was a mirage which passed, a mirage or some dear vanishing dream. "'Take one yourself, Ellen,' he directed. Keep the other one carefully for Alfred. She snatched them from his hand, and before he could stop her, she had thrown them out the open window into the street. He was, for an instant, stricken dumb. And you, she cried fiercely, you can follow your beans as soon as you choose. He looked at her and realized how completely he had failed. She was indeed stirred to the very depths of her nature, but the emotion which possessed her was one of passionate and jealous anger. "'Not good enough for you as we are, eh?' she cried. "'You don't like our clothes or our manners? You've got to be a fine gentleman in five minutes, haven't you? We were good enough for you when thirty shillings a week didn't seem enough to keep us out of debt, and I stitched my fingers to the bone with odd bits of dressmaking. Good enough for you then, my man, when I cooked your dinner, washed your clothes, kept your house clean, and bore your son, working to the last moment until my head swam and my knees tottered. Truth! Truth, indeed! What is there but truth in my life? I'd like to know. Have I ever told you a lie? Have I ever looked at another man, or let one touch my fingers, since the day when you put that ring on, and now? Take it, and get out! She wrenched her wedding ring from her finger and threw it upon the ground between them. Her bosom was heaving, her cheeks were red and her eyes glittering. Several wisps of her hair had been unable to stand the excitement and were hanging down. The mauve bow had worked its way onto one side very nearly under her ear. There was no deceit or any pretense about her. She was the daughter of a washerwoman and a greengrocer, 
and heredity had triumphantly asserted itself. Yet as he backed toward the door before her fierce onslaught, Burton, for the first time since this new thing had come, positively admired her. Ellen, he protested, you're behaving foolishly. I wanted you and the boy to understand. I wanted you to share the things which I had found. It was the only way we could be happy together. Alfred and I will look after ourselves and our own happiness, she declared with a little gulp. Other women have lost their husbands. I can bear it. Why don't you go? Don't you know the way out? Burton offered his hand. She frankly scoffed at him. I don't understand all that rigmarole about truth, she concluded, but I'm no sort of one at pretense. Outside, my man, and stay outside. She slammed the door. Burton found himself in the street. Instinctively he felt that her hasty dismissal was intended to conceal from him the torrent of tears which were imminent. A little dazed, he still groped his way to the spot where Ellen had thrown the beans. A man was there with a fruit barrel, busy apparently rearranging his stock. Something about his appearance struck Burton with a chill premonition. He came to a standstill and looked at him. "'Did you wish to buy any fruit, sir?' the man asked, in a tone unusually subdued for one of his class. Burton shook his head. "'I was just wondering what you were doing,' he remarked. The man hesitated. "'To tell you the truth, Governor,' he confessed, "'I was mixing up my apples and bananas a bit. "'You see, those at the top were all my best, "'and it has been my custom to add a few from underneath there, "'most of them a little going off. "'It was the only way he added with a sigh, that one could make a profit. I've made up my mind, though, to either throw them away or sell them separately for what they're worth, which isn't much. I've had enough of deceiving the public. If I can't get a living honestly with this barrel, I'll try another job. Did you happen to have eaten anything just lately? Burton asked him with a sinking heart. The man looked at his questioner for a moment doubtfully. "'Had my breakfast at seven, he replied. "'Just a bite of bread and cheese since then, with my morning beer.' "'Nothing since? Nothing at all?' Burton pressed. "'I picked up a funny-colored bean and ate it a few minutes ago. "'Queer flavor it had, too. Nothing else that I can think of.' Burton looked at the man and down at his barrel. He glanced around at the neighborhood in which he had to make a living. Then he groaned softly to himself. "'Good luck to you.' he murmured, and turned away. End of chapter 10 Recording by Blaine Chapter 11 of The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela the Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim Chapter 11 The Gates into Paradise The girl looked up from her seat wonderingly. His coming had been a little precipitate. His appearance, too, betokened a disturbed mind. There is a front door, she reminded him. There are also bells. I could not wait, he answered simply. I saw the flutter of your gown as I came along the lane, and I climbed the wall. All the way down I fancied that you might be wearing blue. A slight air of reserve, which she had carefully prepared for him, faded away. What was the use? He was such an extraordinary person. It was not possible to measure him by the usual standards. She was obliged to smile. You find blue becoming? Adorable, he replied fervently. I have dreamed of you in blue. You wore blue only the night before last when I wrote my little sketch of the pavements of Bond Street on a summer afternoon. She pointed to the journal which lay at her feet. I recognize myself, of course, she declared, trying to speak severely. It was most improper of you. It was nothing of the sort, he answered bluntly. You came into the picture, and I could not keep you out. You were there, so you had to stay. It was much too flattering, she objected. Again he contradicted her. I could not flatter if I tried, he assured her. It was just you, he laughed softly. It is so difficult to argue with you, she murmured. All the same, I think that it was most improper. But then everything you do is improper. You had no right to climb over the wall. You had no right to walk here with me the other afternoon, even though you had driven away a tame cow. You have no right whatever to be here today. What about your wife? I have been to Garden Green, he announced. I offered her emancipation, the same emancipation as that which I myself have attained. She refused it absolutely. 
She is satisfied with garden green. You mean, the girl asked, that she refuses the, the beans, he said, precisely. She did more than refuse them. She threw them out the window. She has no imagination. From her point of view, I suppose she behaved in a perfectly natural fashion. She told me to go my own way and leave her alone. Edith sighed. It is very unfortunate, she declared, that you were not able to convince her. Is it? he replied. I tried my best, and when I had failed, I was glad. She raised her eyes for a moment, but she shook her head. I am afraid that it doesn't make any difference, does it? Why not? It makes all the difference, he insisted. My dear Mr. Burton, she expostulated, making room for him to sit down beside her, I cannot possibly allow you to make love to me because your wife refuses to swallow a bean. But she threw them out the window, he persisted. She understood quite well what she was doing. Her action was entirely symbolical. She declared for garden green and the vulgar life. For a girl who lived in an old-fashioned garden, who seemed herself to be part of a fairy story, Edith certainly took a practical view of the situation. I am afraid, she murmured, that the divorce courts have no jurisdiction over your case. You are therefore a married man, and likely to continue a married man. I cannot possibly allow you to hold my hand. His head swam for a minute. She was very alluring, with her pale face set in its clouds of golden hair, her faintly wrinkled forehead, her bewitchingly regretful smile, regretful yet in a sense provocative. I am in love with you, he declared. Naturally, she replied, the question is, she paused and looked intently at the tip of her slipper. It was very small and very pointed, and it was quite impossible to ignore the fact that she had a remarkably pretty foot and that she wore white silk stockings. Burton had never known anyone before who wore white silk stockings. I am very much in love with you, he repeated. I cannot help it. It is not my fault. That is to say, it is as much your fault as it is mine. The corners of her mouth twitched. Is it? Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to take you down to the orchard through the little gate and across the plank into the hayfield, he announced boldly. I am going to sit with you under the oak tree, where we can just catch the view of the moor through the dip in the hills. We will lean back and watch the clouds, those little white fleecy broken-off pieces, and I will tell you fairy stories. We shall be quite alone there, and perhaps you will let me hold your hand. She shook her head, gently but very firmly. Such things are impossible. Because I have a wife at Garden Green? She nodded. Because you have a wife, and because, I had really quite forgotten to mention it before, but as a matter of fact, I am half engaged to someone myself. He went suddenly white. You are not serious, he demanded. Perfectly, she assured him. I can't think how I forgot it. Does he come here to see you? Burton asked jealously. Not very often. He has to work hard. Burton leaned back in his seat. The music of life seemed suddenly to be playing afar off, so far that he could only dimly catch the strains. The wind, too, must have changed. The perfume of the roses reached him no more. I thought you understood, he said slowly. She did not speak again for several moments. Then she rose a little abruptly to her feet. You can walk as far as a hayfields with me, she said. They passed down the narrow garden path in single file. There had been a storm in the night, and the beds of pink and white stalks lay dashed and drooping with a weight of glistening raindrops. The path was strewn with rose petals, and the air seemed fuller than ever of a fresh and delicate fragrance. At the very end of the garden, a little gate led into the orchard. Side by side they passed beneath the trees. Tell me, he begged in a low tone, about this lover of yours. There is so little to tell, she answered. He is a member of the firm who published books for my father. He is quite kind to both of us. He used to come down here more often, even, than he does now, and one night he asked my father whether he might speak to me. And your father? My father was very much pleased, she continued. We have little money and father is not very strong. He told me that it had taken a weight off his mind. How often does he come? Burton asked. He was here last Sunday week. Last Sunday week and you call him your lover? No, I have not called him that, she reminded him gently. He is not that sort of man. Only I think that he is the person whom I shall marry, some day. I am sure that you are beginning to like me, he insisted. She turned and looked at him, at his pale, eager face with the hollow eyes, the tremulous mouth, a curiously negative and wholly indescribable figure, yet in some dim sense impressive through certain unspelt suggestions of latent force. No one could have described him in those days, though no one with perceptions could have failed to observe much that was unusual in his personality. It is true, she admitted, I do like you. You seem to carry some quality with you which I do not understand. What is it, I wonder? It is something that reminds me of your writing. I think it is truthfulness, he told her. That is no virtue on my part. It is sheer necessity. I am quite sure that if I had not been obliged, I should never have told you that it was I who stared at you from the common there, one of the hideous little band of trippers. I should not even have told you about my wife. It is all so humiliating. It was yourself which obliged yourself, she pointed out. I mean that the truthfulness was part of yourself. Do you know it has set me thinking so often? If only people realized how attractive absolute simplicity, absolute candor is, 
the world would be so much easier a place to live in, and so much more beautiful. Life is so full of small shams, so many imperfectly hidden little deceits. Even if you had not told me this strange story about yourself, I think that I should still have felt this quality about you. I should like, he declared, to have you conceive a passion for the truth. I should like to have you feel that it was not possible to live anyhow or anywhere else save in its light. If you really felt that it would be like a guiding star to you through life, you would never be able to even consider marriage with a man whom you did not love. This evening, she says slowly, he is coming down. I was thinking it all over this afternoon. I have made up my mind to say nothing about you. Since you came, however, I feel differently. I shall tell him everything. Perhaps, Burton suggested, hopefully, he may be jealous. It is possible, she assented. He does not seem like that, but one can never tell. He may even give you up, she smiled. If he did, she reminded him, it would not make any difference. I will not admit that, he declared. I want your love. I want your whole love. I want you to feel the same things that I feel, in the same way. You live in two places, in a real garden and a fairy garden, the fairy garden of my dreams. I want you to leave the real garden and let me try and teach you how beautiful the garden of fancies may become. She sighed. Alas, she said, it is because I may not come and live always in that fairy garden that I am going to send you away. Don't, he pleaded. Not altogether at any rate. Life is so short, so pitifully incomplete. We live through so many epochs, and each epoch has its own personality. It was not I who married Ellen. It was Burton, the auctioneer's clerk. I cannot carry the burden of that fellow's asinine mistakes upon my shoulders forever. I am afraid, she murmured, that however clever the Mr. Burton of today may be, he will never be able to rid himself altogether of his predecessor's burdens. They were leaning over the gate, looking into the deserted hayfield. The quiet of evening had stolen down upon them. He drew a little nearer to her. Dear, he whispered, there isn't really any Ellen, there isn't really any woman in the world of my thoughts, the world in which I live, save you. She was almost in his arm. She did not resist, but she looked a little pitifully into his face. You will not, please, she begged. Once more the music passed away into the clouds. It was the gate into paradise over which he had leaned, but the gate was locked, and as he stood there it seemed to grow higher and higher until he could not even see over the top. Almost roughly he turned away. Quite right, he muttered. I must not touch the princess of my fairy garden. Only let us go back now, please. I cannot stay here any longer. She obeyed at once. There was a queer, pathetic little droop at the corners of her lips, and she avoided his eyes. Goodbye, he said. His tone was dull and spiritless. Something, for the moment, seemed to have passed from him. He seemed, indeed, to lack both inspiration and courage. Her fingers clung slightly to his. She was praying, even, that he might laugh to scorn her unspoken appeal. He moved a yard away and stood looking at her. Her heart began to beat wildly. Surely her prayer would be granted. The light of adoration was coming back to his eyes. "'I cannot see the truth,' he cried hoarsely. "'You belong to me. I feel that you belong to me. You are part of the great life. I have found you. You are mine.' And yet, I feel I mustn't touch you. I don't understand. Perhaps I shall come back. He turned and hurried off. She watched him until he was a speck upon the road. Watched him, even then, from among the shadows of the trees. There was a lump in her throat and a misty light in her eyes. She had forgotten everything that had seemed absurd to her in this strange little romance. Her eyes and her arms, almost her lips, were calling him to her. End of chapter 11 Recording by Joe Sela Chapter 12 of The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter 12 A Bolt from the Blue. Burton's life moved for a time among the easy places the sub-editor of the piccadilly gazette to which he still contributed voluntarily increased his scale of pay and was insatiable in his demand for copy burton moved into pleasant rooms at a sunny corner of an old-fashioned square he sent ellen three pounds a week all she would accept and save for a dull pain at his heart which seldom left him he found much pleasure in life then came the first little break in the clear sky mr waddington came in to see him one day and mr waddington was looking distinctly worried he was neatly and tastefully dressed and his demeanour had lost all its old offensiveness his manner too was immensely improved his tone was almost gentle 
nevertheless there was a perplexed frown upon his forehead and an anxious look in his eyes business all right i hope burton asked him after he had welcomed his late employer installed him in an easy chair and pushed a box of cigarettes towards him it is better than all right mr waddington replied it is wonderful we have never had such crowds at the sales and i have taken on four more clerks in the house letting department burton laughed softly the humor of the auctioneer's position appealed to him immensely i am making money fast mr waddington admitted without enthusiasm another year or two of this and i could retire comfortably then what burton asked is the worry mr waddington smoked vigorously for a moment has it ever occurred to you burton he inquired to ask yourself whether this peculiar state in which you and i find ourselves may be wholly permanent burton was genuinely startled he sat looking at his visitor like one turned to stone the prospect called up by that simple question was appalling his cigarette burned idly away between his fingers the shadow of fear lurked in his eyes not permanent he repeated i never thought of that why do you ask mr waddington scratched his chin thoughtfully it was not a graceful proceeding and burton with a sinking heart remembered that this was one of his employer's old habits he scrutinized his visitor more closely although his appearance at first sight was immaculate there were certain alarming symptoms to be noted his linen collar was certainly doing service for the second time and burton noticed with dismay a slight revival of the auctioneer's taste for loud colors in his shirt and socks it was yesterday afternoon mr waddington continued i was selling an oak chest i explained that it was not a genuine antique but that it had certainly some claims to antiquity on account of its design that seemed to me to be a very fair way of putting it then i saw a man who was very keen on buying it examining the brass handles he looked up at me why the handles are genuine he exclaimed they're real old brass anyway now i knew quite well burton that these handles though they were extraordinarily near the real thing were not genuine i opened my mouth to tell him so and then burton do you know that i hesitated you didn't tell him that they were genuine burton gasped mr waddington shook his head no he admitted i did not go so far as that still it was almost as great a shock to me i felt a distinct impulse to tell him that they were a few days ago such an idea would never have entered my head it would have been a sheer impossibility anything else mr waddington hesitated he seemed to be feeling the shame of these avowals this morning he confessed i passed the door of the golden lion on my way to the office for the first time since you know when i felt a desire a faint desire but still it was there to go in and chafe milly and have a pint of beer and a tankard i didn't go of course but i felt the impulse nevertheless burton had turned very pale this he exclaimed is terrible what have you done with the rest of the beans i have nine mr waddington replied i carried them in my waistcoat pocket i'm perfectly convinced now that there is trouble ahead for on my way up the stairs here i felt a strong inclination to tell you that i had lost them in case you should want any it would be only fair burton declared warmly to divide them mr waddington frowned i see no reason for that at all he objected feeling his waistcoat pocket the beans are in my possession but if we are to revert to our former state of barbarism burton urged let us at least do so together you are some time ahead of me mr waddington pointed it out none of these warnings have come to you yet it may be something wrong with my disposition or the way i've swallowed my bean yours may be a permanent affair burton hesitated then he threw himself into a chair and buried his face in his hands 
my time is coming too he confessed mournfully i am in the same position even while you were speaking just now i felt a strong desire to deceive you to invent some experience similar to your own are you sure of that mr waddington asked anxiously why sure burton groaned then we are both of us in it and that's a fact mr waddington affirmed burton looked up about those beans mr waddington thought for some few moments i shall keep five and give you four he decided it is treating you very generously i am not obliged to give you any at all you know i'm doing it because i'm good-natured and because we are in this thing together if the worst happens you can come back to your old place in the firm i dare say we shall pull along somehow burton shuddered from head to foot he saw it all mapped out before him the miserable routine of dull undignified work the whole intolerable outlook of that daily life he covered his face with his hands to shut out the prospect i couldn't come back he muttered i couldn't that's all very well mr waddington objected but if this thing really passes off you'll be only too glad to i suppose i shall flirt with milly again and drink beer give up ruskin for the sporting times wear loud clothes tell most frightful falsehoods when i sell that terrible furniture and buy another trotting horse to drive out on sundays oh lord mr waddington rose slowly to his feet he lit a cigarette sniffed it and looked at it disparagingly it was very fine turkish tobacco and one of burton's extravagances i'm not sure after all he declared that there isn't more flavor in a british cigar burton shuddered you had better take a bean at once he groaned those cigarettes are made from the finest tobacco imported mr waddington felt in his waistcoat pocket with trembling fingers slowly produced a little silver box took out a bean and crunched it between his teeth an expression of immense relief at once spread over his features he sniffed at his cigarette with an air of keen appreciation and deliberately handed over to burton his share of the remaining beans i am myself again he declared firmly i can feel the change already burton eyed him anxiously cigarette taste all right now delicious mr waddington replied most exquisite tobacco makes me shiver inside to think how i could ever have smoked that other filthy rubbish no idea of calling in at the golden lion on your way back eh burton persisted mr waddington's expression was full of reproach the very thought of that place with its smell of stale beer and those awful creatures behind the bar makes me shiver he confessed i shall walk for an hour before lunch in kensington gardens if i have a moment to spare i shall run into the museum and spend a little time with the mosaics what a charming effect the sunlight has coming through those trees burton i want you to come down and see my room some time i've picked up a few trifles that i think you would appreciate i will come with pleasure burton replied this afternoon if you could spare a few minutes the auctioneer suggested we might go around and look at that romney which has just been unearthed i've been to christie's three times already to see it but i should like to take you there's something about the face which i don't quite understand there is a landscape there too just sent up from some country house which i think would interest you burton shook his head and moved feverishly towards his desk i'm going to work he declared you have frightened me a little i must economize time i shall write a novel a novel of real life i must write it while i can still see the perfect truth End of chapter twelve recording by john brandon Chapter Thirteen of the Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by John Brandon. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter 13. Proof Positive. Burton did not get very far with his novel. About nine o'clock on the same evening, Mr. Waddington, who was spending a quiet hour or two with his books, was disturbed by a hasty knock at the door of his rooms. He rose with some reluctance from his chair to answer the summons. Burton, he exclaimed. Burton came quickly in. He was paler even than usual, and there were black shadows under his eyes. There was a change in his face, indescribable but very apparent. His eyes had lost their dreamy look. He glanced furtively about him. He had the air of a man who has committed a crime and fears detection. His dress was not nearly so neat as usual. Mr. Waddington, whose bachelor evening clothes, a loose dinner jacket, and carefully tied black tie were exactly as they should be, glanced disparagingly at his visitor. My dear Burton, he gasped, whatever is the matter with you? You seem all knocked over. Burton had thrown himself into a chair. He was contemplating the little silver box which he had drawn from his pocket. I've got to take one of these, he muttered, that's all. When I've eaten it, there will be three left. I took the last one exactly two months and four days ago. At the same rate, in just eight months and sixteen days, I shall be back again in bondage. Mr. Waddington was very much interested. He was also a little distressed. Are you quite sure, he asked, of your symptoms? Absolutely certain, Burton declared sadly. I found myself this evening trying to kiss my landlady's daughter, who is not in the least good-looking. I was attracted by the program of a music hall and had hard work to keep from going there. A man asked me the way to Leicester Square just now, and I almost directed him wrongly for the sheer pleasure of telling a lie. I nearly bought some ties at an outfitter shop in the Strand. Such ties! It's awful, awful, Mr. Waddington. Mr. Waddington nodded his head compassionately. I suppose you know what you're talking about, he said. You see, I have already taken my second bean, and to me the things that you have spoken of seem altogether incredible. I could not bring myself to believe that an absolute return to those former horrible conditions would be possible for either you or me. By the by, he added with a sudden change of tone, I've just managed to get a photograph of the Romney I was telling you of. Burton waved it away. It doesn't interest me in the least, he declared gloomily. I very nearly bought a copy of Ally Sloper on my way down here. Mr. Waddington shivered. I suppose there is no hope for you, he said. It is excessively painful for me to see you in this state. On the whole, I think that the sooner you take the bean, the better. Burton suddenly sat up in his chair. What are those sheets of paper you have on the table? he asked quickly. They are the sheets of paper left with a little flower pot in the room of Idle May House, Mr. Waddington answered. I was just looking them through and wondering what language it was they were written in. It is curious, too, that our friend should have only translated the last few lines. Burton rose from his chair and leaned over the table, looking at them with keen interest. It was about those papers that I started out to come and see you he declared there must be some way by which we could make the action of these beans more permanent i propose that we get the rest of the pages translated we may find them most valuable mr waddington was rather inclined to favor the idea i cannot think he admitted why it never occurred to us before whom do you propose to take them to there is some one i know who lives a little way down in the country burton replied he's a great antiquarian and egyptologist and if any one can translate them i should think he would be able to lend me the sheets of manuscript just as they are and i will take them down to him tomorrow. it may tell us perhaps how to deal with the plant so that we can get more of the beans eight months is no use to me when i'm like this just drifting back everything seems possible i can even see myself back at clamata's villa walking with ellen listening to the band leaning over the bar at the golden lion listen he stopped short a barrel organ outside was playing a music hall ditty his head kept time to the music i wish i had my banjo he exclaimed impulsively 
then he shivered did you hear that a banjo i used to play it you know mr waddington looked shocked the banjo he repeated do you really mean that you want to play it at the present moment i do burton replied if i had it with me now i should play that tune i should play others like it everything seems to be slipping away from me i can smell the supper cooking in my little kitchen at clematis villa delicious my god i can't bear it any longer here goes he took a bean from his pocket with trembling fingers and swallowed it then he leaned back in his chair for several moments with closed eyes when he opened them again an expression of intense relief was upon his face i am coming back already he declared faintly thank heavens mr waddington your room is charming sir japanese prints too i had no idea you're interested in them that third one is exquisite and what a dado hewlings himself designed it for me mr waddington observed with satisfaction there are several things i should like you to notice burton that lacquer work box burton was already holding it in his fingers and was gazing at it lovingly it is perfect he admitted what workmanship you are indeed fortunate mr waddington and isn't that mona lisa on the walls what a beautiful reproduction i am saving up money even now to go to paris to see the original only a few nights ago i was reading potter's appreciation of it he rose and wandered around the room making murmured comments all the time presently he came back to the table and glanced down at the sheets of manuscript mr waddington he said let me take these to my friend i feel that the last few hours must have been a sort of nightmare and yet he drew out a little box from his waistcoat pocket and peered inside he was suddenly grave it was no nightmare then he muttered i have really taken a bean you took it not a quarter of an hour ago mr waddington told him burton sighed it is awful to imagine that i should have needed it he confessed there must be some way out of this you will trust me with these sheets mr waddington if my friend in the country can do nothing for us i will take them to the british museum by all means mr waddington replied take care of them bring them back safely i should like if possible to have a written translation it should indeed prove most interesting burton went out with the musky smelling sheets in his pocket all the temptations of the earlier part of the evening had completely passed away he walked slowly because a big yellow moon hung down from the sky and because mr waddington's rooms were in a neighborhood of leafy squares and picturesque houses when he came back to the more travelled ways he ceased however to look about him he took a bus to westminster and returned to his rooms somehow or other the possession of the sheets acted like a sedative he felt a new confidence in himself the absurdity of any return to his former state had never been more established the remainder of the night he spent in the same way as many others he drew his writing table up to the open window and with the lights of the city and the river spread out before him and the faint wind blowing into the room he worked at his novel End of chapter 13 recording by john brandon chapter 14 of the double life of mr alfred burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by pseudonymous nerd in mumbai india chapter 14 the legend of the perfect food a foretaste of autumn had crept into the midst of summer there were gray clouds in the sky a north wind booming across the moors burton even shivered as he walked down the hill to the house where she lived there was still gorse still heather still a few roses in the garden and a glimmering vision of the beds of the other flowers in the background but the sun which gave them life was hidden burton looked eagerly into the garden and his heart sank there was no sign there of any living person 
After a moment's hesitation, he opened the gate, passed up the neat little path and rang the bell. It was opened after the briefest of delays by the trim parlour maid. Is your mistress at home? he asked. Miss Edith has gone to London for two days, sir, the girl announced. The professor is in his study, sir. Burton stood quite still for a moment. It was absurd that his heart should be so suddenly heavy, that all the spring and buoyancy should have gone out of life. For the first time he realised the direction in which his thoughts had been travelling since he had left his rooms an hour ago. He had to remind himself that it was the professor whom he had gone to see. Mr. Cooper received him graciously, if a little vaguely. Burton wasted no time, however, in announcing the nature of his errand. Directly he produced the sheets, the professor became interested. The faint odour which she had shaken out of them into the room stimulated his curiosity. He sniffed at it with great content. <laughs> strange, he remarked. Very strange. I haven't smelled that perfume since I was with the excavators at Chaldee. A real oriental flavour, young man, about your manuscript. There is very little of it, Burton said. Just a page or so, which apparently the writer never had time to finish. The sheets came into my hand in a rather curious way, and I should very much like to have an exact translation of them. I don't even know what the language is. I thought perhaps you might be able to help me. I will explain to you later, if you allow me, the exact nature of my interest in them. Mr. Cooper took the pages into his hand with a benevolent smile. At first glance, however, his expression changed. It was obvious that he was greatly interested. It was obvious also that he was correspondingly surprised. My dear young man, he exclaimed. My dear Mr. Mr. Burton, why, this is wonderful. Where did you get these sheets, do you say? Are you honestly telling me that they were written within the last 1,000 years? Without a doubt, Mr. Burton replied. They were written in London a few months ago. Mr. Cooper was already busy surrounding himself with strange-looking volumes. His face displayed the most utmost enthusiasm in his task. It is most amazing, this, he declared, drawing up a chair to the table. These sheets are written in a language which has been dead as a medium of actual intercourse over two thousand years. You meet with it sometimes in old Egyptian manuscripts. There is a monastery somewhere near the excavations which I had the honour to conduct in Syria, where an ancient prayer book contained prayers in this language. Literally, I cannot translate this for you. Actually, I will. I can get at the sense, I can get at the sense quite well. But if one could only find the man who wrote it, he is the man who I would like to see. Mr. Burton, if the pages were written so recently, where is the writer? He is dead, Burton replied. Mr. Cooper sighed. Um, well, well, he continued, starting upon his task with avidity. We will talk about him presently. This is indeed miraculous. I am deeply grateful to you for having brought me this manuscript. Mr. Cooper was busy for the next quarter of an hour. His expression, as he turned up dictionaries and made notes, was still full of the liveliest and most intense interest. Presently, he leaned back in his chair. He kept one hand upon the loose sheets of the manuscript, while with the other he removed his spectacles and closed his eyes for a moment. My young friend, he said, did you ever hear a quaint Asiatic legend? Perhaps a superstition, you could say, that many and many a wise man for 4,000 years spent his nights and his days, not as our more modern scientists of a few hundred years ago have done, in the attempt to turn baser metals into gold, but in the attempt to constitute from simple elements the perfect food for man. 
Burton shook his head. He was somewhat mystified. I have never heard anything of the sort, he acknowledged. The whole literature of ancient Egypt and the neighbouring countries, Mr. Cooper proceeded, abounds with mystical stories of this perfect food. It was to come to man in the nature of a fruit. It was to give him not eternal life, for that was valueless, but eternal and absolute understanding, so that nothing in life could be harmful, nothing save objects and thoughts of beauty could present themselves to the understanding of the fortunate person who partook of it. These pages which you have brought to me translate are concerned with this superstition. The writer claims that he has created this fruit, whose spiritual result upon a normal man is such as to turn him into a thing of from a thing of clay into something approaching a god. Did he mention anything about beans? Burton asked anxiously. Mr. Cooper nodded benignantly. The perfect food referred to, he said, appears to have been produced in the shape of small beans. They are to be eaten with great care and to ensure permanency in the results. A green leaf of the little tree is to follow the consumption of the bean. Burton sprang to his feet. A thousand thanks, Professor, he cried. That is the one thing we were seeking to discover. The leaves, of course. Mr. Cooper looked at his visitor in amazement. My young friend, he said, are you going to tell me that you have seen one of these beans? Not only that, but I have eaten one, Burton said. In fact, I have eaten two. Mr. Cooper was greatly excited. Where are they? Show me one. Where is the tree? How did the man come to write this? Where did he write it? Let me see one of the beans. Burton produced the little silver snuff box in which he carried them. With his left hand, he kept the professor away. Mr. Cooper, he said, I cannot let you touch or handle them until I am sure of this superstition you have told me. They mean more to me than I can tell you. Yet there they are. And let me tell you this, that superstition you have spoken of has truth in it. These beans are indeed a spiritual food. They alter character. They have the most amazing effect upon a man's moral system. Young man, Mr. Cooper insisted. I must eat one. Burton shook his head. Mr. Cooper, he said, there are reasons why I find it very hard to deny you anything. But as regards those beans, you will neither eat one nor even hold it in your hand. Sit down and I shall tell you a story which sounds which and might have happened a thousand years ago. It happened in the last three months. Listen. Burton told his story with absolute sincerity. The professor was intensely interested. It was perhaps strange that, extraordinary though it was, he never for one minute doubted the truth of what he heard. When Burton had finished, he rose to his feet in a state of great excitement. This is indeed wonderful, he declared. It is more wonderful even than you can know of. The legend of the perfect food appears in the manuscripts of many centuries. It antedates literature by generations. There is a tomb in the interior of Japan, sacred to a saint, who for seventy years worked for the production of this very bean. That, let me tell you, was three thousand years ago. My young friend, you have indeed been favoured. Let me understand this thing, Burton said anxiously. Those pages say that if one eats a green leaf after the bean, the change wrought in one will be absolutely permanent. That is so, the professor assented. Now all that you have to do is eat a green leaf from the little tree. After that, you will have no more need of these three beans, and therefore you can give them to me. Burton made no attempt to produce his little silver box. First of all, he said, I must test the truth of this. I cannot run any risks. I must go and eat a leaf. If in three months no change has taken place in me, I will lend you a bean to examine. I can do no more than that. Until this matter is absolutely settled, they are worth more than life itself to me. Mr. Cooper seemed annoyed. Surely, he protested, 
You are not going to ask me to wait three months until I can examine one of these. Three months will soon pass, Burton replied. Until that time is up, I could not part with them. But you can't imagine, the professor pleaded, how marvelously, marvelously interesting this is to me. Remember that I have spent all my life digging among the archives and the literature and the superstitions of these pre-Egyptian people. You are the first man in the world, outside a little circle of fellow workers, to come to speak of me of this food. Your story that how came into your hands is the most amazing romance I have ever heard. It confirms many of my theories. It is wonderful. Do you realize what has happened? You, in your insignificant person, the professor continued, shaking his finger at his visitor, have tasted the result of thousands of years of unceasing study. Wise men in their cells, before Athens was built, before pyramids were conceived, were thinking out this matter in strange parts of Egypt, Syria and Asia. For generations their dream has been looked upon as a thing as elusive as the philosopher's stone, the transmutation of metals, any of these unsolved problems. For five hundred years, since the day of a Russian scientist who lived on the Black Sea, but whose name for the moment I have forgotten, the whole subject has lain dead. It is indeed true that the fairy tales of one generation become the science of the next. Our own learned men have been blind. The whole chain of reasoning is so clear. Every article of human food contains its separate particles affecting the moral as well as the physical systems. Why should it have been deemed necromancy to endeavour to combine these parts to evolve by careful elimination and change to the perfect food? In the house, young man, which you have told me of, there died the hero of the greatest discovery which has ever been made since the world began to spin upon its orbit. Will Miss Edith be back tomorrow? Burton asked. The professor stared at him. Miss Edith, he replied. Oh, my daughter, is she not in? She is away for two days, your servant told me, Burton replied. Perhaps so, perhaps so, the professor agreed. She has gone to her aunt's, very likely in Chelsea. My sister has a house there in Bromsgrove Terrace. Burton rose to his feet. He held out his hand for the manuscript. I am extremely obliged to you, my dear sir. Now I must go. The professor gripped the manuscript in his hand. He was no longer a harmless and benevolent old gentleman. He was like a wild animal about to be robbed of this prey. No, he cried. You must not take these away. You must not even think of it. Leave me these sheets just as they are. I will go no further back. There are several words, the meaning of which I have only guessed. Leave them with me for a few days and I will make you an exact translation. Very well, Burton assented. And one bean, leave me one bean only. I promise not to eat it, not to dissect it, not to subject it to any experiments of a sort. Let me just have a look at it to be sure what you have told me is not a hallucination. Burton shook his head. I dare not part with one. I am going back, straight back, to test the leaf theory. If it is correct, I shall keep my promise. And will you remember me to Miss Edith when she returns? To Miss Edith? Yes, yes, of course. Mr. Cooper declared impatiently. When shall you be down again, my young friend? He went on honestly. I want to hear more of your experiences. I want you to tell me the whole thing over again. I shall get a signed statement from you. There are several points in connection with what you say which bear out a favourite theory of mine. I will come in a few days if I may, Mr. Burton assured him. The professor walked his guest to the front door. He seemed reluctant to let him go. Take care of yourself, Mr. Burton, he said. Yours is a precious life. On no account subject yourself to any risk. Be careful of crossings. Don't expose yourself to inclement weather. Keep away from any place likely to harbour infectious disease. I should very much like to have a meeting in London of a few of my friends if I could ensure your presence. When I come down again, Mr. Burton promised, we will discuss this. He shook hands and hurried away. In less than an hour and a half, he was in Mr. Waddington's room. The latter had just arrived from office. Mr. Waddington, 
Burton exclaimed. The little tree on which the beans grew, where is it? Mr. Waddington was taken aback. But I picked all the beans, he replied. There were only the leaves left. Never mind that, Burton cried. It is the leaves we want. The tree, where is it? Quick, I want myself to feel absolutely safe. Mr. Waddington's face was blank. You have heard the translation of those sheets? I have, Burton answered hastily. I will tell you all about it directly, as soon as you have brought me the tree. Mr. Waddington turned a little pale. I gave it to a child in the street on my way home from Idlemay House, he declared. There was no sign of any more beans coming, and I had more than enough to carry. End of chapter 14 of The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton Chapter 15 of The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter 15. The Professor Insists. Crouched over his writing table, with sheets of manuscript on every side of him, Burton worked like a slave at his novel. After a week devoted by Mr. Waddington and himself to a fruitless search for the missing plant, they had handed the matter over to a private detective, and Burton had settled down to make the most of the time before him. Day after day of strange joys had dawned and passed away. He had peopled his room with shadows, Edith had looked at him out of her wonderful eyes. He had felt the touch of her fingers as she had knelt by his side, the glow which had crept into his heart as he had read to her fragments of his story and listened to her words of praise. The wall which he had built stood firm and fast. He lived in his new days. Life was all foreground, and hour by hour the splendid fancies came. It was his first great effort at composition. Those little studies of his, as he had passed backwards and forwards through the streets and crowded places, had counted for little. Here he was making serious demands upon his new capacity. In a sense it was all very easy, all very wonderful, yet sometimes dejection came. Then his head drooped upon his folded arms, he doubted himself and his work, he told himself that he was living in a fool's paradise, a fool's paradise indeed. One afternoon there came a timid knock at his door. He turned in his chair a little impatiently. Then his pen slipped from his fingers, his left hand gripped the side of the table, his right hand the arm of his chair. It was a dream, of course. I hope we do not disturb you, Mr. Burton, the professor inquired, with anxious amiability. My daughter and I were in the neighborhood, and I could not resist the visit. We had some trouble at first in finding you. Burton rose to his feet. He was looking past the professor straight into Edith's eyes. In her white muslin gown, her white hat, and flowing white veil, she seemed to him more wonderful, indeed, than any of those cherished fancies of her which had passed through his room night and day to the music of his thoughts. "'I am glad,' he said simply. "'Of course I am glad to see you. Please come in. It is very untidy here. I have been hard at work.' He placed chairs for them. The professor glanced around the room with some satisfaction. It was bare, but there was nothing discordant upon the walls or in the furniture. There were many evidences, too, of a scholarly and cultivated taste. Edith had glided past him to the window, and was murmuring her praises of the view. "'I have never seen a prettier view of the river in my life,' she declared, "'and I love your big window. It is almost like living out of doors, this.' and how industrious you have been. She pointed to the sea of loose sheets which covered the table and the floor. He smiled. He was beginning to recover himself. I have been working very hard, he admitted. But why, she murmured, you are young. Surely there is plenty of time. Is it because the thoughts have come to you and you dared not dally with them? Or is it because you are like everyone else in such a terrible hurry to become rich and famous? He shook his head. It is not that, he said. I have no thought of either. 
Alas, he added, looking into her eyes, I lack the great incentive. Then why is it? she whispered. You must not ask our young friend too many questions, the professor interrupted, a trifle impatiently. Tell me, Mr. Burton, has there been any change um, in your condition? Burton shivered for a moment. None at present, he admitted. It is scarcely due as yet. Mr. Cowper drew his chair a little nearer. His face betokened the liveliest interest. Edith stood in the window for a moment, and then sank into a chair in the background. With reference to your last remark, the professor went on, it has yet, I think, to be proved that these beans are of equal potency. You understand me, I'm sure, Mr. Burton. I mean that it does not in the least follow that because one of them is able to keep you in an abnormal condition for two months, the next one will keep you there for the same period. Burton was frankly startled. Is there anything about that in the translation, sir? he asked. There is this sentence which I will read to you the professor pronounced, drawing a roll of paper from his pocket and adjusting his spectacles. I have now a more or less correct translation of the sheets you left with me, a copy of which is at your disposal. Here it is. The formula is now enunciated and proved. The secret, which has defied the sages of the world since the ages of twilight, has yielded itself to me, the nineteenth seeker after the truth in one direct line. One slight detail alone baffles me. So far as I have gone at present, the constituent parts containing always the same elements and producing therefore the same effect appear in variable dimensions or potencies for reasons which at present elude me. Of my formula there is no longer any doubt. This substance which I have produced shall purify and make holy the world. The professor looked up from his paper. Our interesting friend, he remarked, seems to have been interrupted at this point, probably by the commencement of that illness, which had unfortunately a fatal conclusion. Yet the meaning of what he writes is perfectly clear. This substance, consolidated, I believe, into what you term a bean, is not equally distributed. Therefore, I take it that you may remain in your present condition for a longer or shorter period of time. The potency of the first uh, dose is nothing to go by. You have, however, already learned how to render your present condition eternal. Burton sighed. The knowledge came too late, he said. The tree had disappeared. It was given away by the Mr. Waddington I told you of to a child whom he met in the street. Dear me, Mr. Cowper exclaimed gravely, this is most disappointing. Is there no chance of recovering it? We are trying, Burton replied. Mr. Waddington has engaged a private detective, and we are also advertising in the papers. You have the beans still, at any rate, the professor remarked, hopefully. We have the beans, Burton admitted, but it is very awkward not knowing how long one's condition is going to last. I might go out without my beans one day and find myself assailed by all manner of amazing inclinations. My dear young man, the professor said earnestly, let me point out to you that this is a wonderful position in which you have been placed. You ought to be most proud and grateful. Any trifling inconveniences which may result should be, I venture to say, utterly ignored by you. Now come, let me ask you a question. Are you feeling absolutely your, uh, how shall I call it, revised self today? Absolutely, thank heaven, Burton declared fervently. The professor nodded his head. All the time his eyes were roving about Burton's person, as though he were longing to make a minute study of his anatomy. It would be most interesting, he said, to trace the commencement of any change in your condition. I am here with a proposition, Mr. Burton. I appeal to you in the name of science as well as uh, hospitality. The change might come to you here while you are alone. There would be no one to remark upon it, no one to make those interesting and instructive notes which, in justice to the cause of progress, should be made by some competent person such as, forgive me, myself. I ask you, therefore, to pack up and return with us to Legate. You shall have a study to yourself. My daughter will be only too pleased and proud to assist you in your work. And I have also a young female who comes to typewrite for me, whose services you can entirely command. I trust that you will not hesitate, Mr. Burton. We are most anxious, indeed we are most anxious, are we not, Edith, to have you come? 
Burton turned his head and glanced toward the girl. She had raised her veil. Her eyes met his, met his question, and evaded it. She studied the pattern of the carpet. When she looked up again, her cheeks were pink. Mr. Burton will be very welcome, she said. There was a short silence in the room. The sunshine fell across the dusty room in a long, quivering shaft. Outside, the branches of an elm tree, swinging in the wind, cast a shadow across the floor. The professor, with folded arms, sat alert and expectant. Burton, pale and shrunken with the labors of the last ten days, looked out of his burning eyes at the girl. For a single moment she had raised her head, had met his fierce inquiry with a certain wistful pathos, puzzling, an incomplete sentiment. Now she, too, was sitting as though in an attitude of waiting. Burton felt his heart suddenly leap. What might lie beyond the wall was of no account. He was a man with only a few brief months to live, as he had come to understand life. He would follow the eternal philosophy. He would do as the others, and make the best of them. It is very kind of you, he said. I am not prepared to make a visit. I mean, my clothes and that sort of thing. But if you will take me as I am, I will come with pleasure. Mr. Cowper's face showed the liveliest satisfaction. Edith, on the other hand, never turned her head, although she felt Burton's eyes upon her. Capital, the professor declared. Now, do not think that we are trying to abduct you, but there is a motor car outside. We are going to take you straight home. You can have a little recreation this beautiful afternoon, a walk in the moors, or some tennis with Edith here. We will try and give you a pleasant time. You must collect your work now, and go and put your things together. We are not in the least hurry. We'll wait. Burton rose a little unsteadily to his feet. He was weary with much labor, carried a little away by this wonderful prospect of living in the same house, of having her by his side continually. It was too amazing to realize. His heart gave a great leap as she moved towards him and looked a little shyly into his face. May I not help you to pick up these sheets? I see that you have numbered them all. I will keep them in their proper order. Perhaps you could trust me to do that while you went and packed your bag. Quite right, my dear, quite right, the professor remarked approvingly. You will find my daughter most careful in such matters, Mr. Burton. She is used to being associated with work of importance. You are very kind, Burton murmured. If you will excuse me, then, for a few moments? By all means, the professor declared. And pray suit yourself entirely, Mr. Burton, as to the clothes you bring and the preparations you make for your visit. If you prefer not to change for the evening, I will do the same. I am renowned in the neighborhood chiefly for my shabbiness and my carpet slippers. Burton paused on the threshold and looked back. Edith was bending over the table, collecting the loose sheets of manuscript. The sunlight had turned her hair almost to the color of flame. Against the background of the open window, her slim, delicate figure, clad in a fashionable mist of lace and muslin, seemed to him like some wonderful piece of intensely modern statuary. Between them, the professor sat with his arms still folded, a benevolent yet pensive smile upon his lips. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. The Double Life of Mr. Alfred Burton by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Chapter Sixteen. Enter Mr. Bonford. I have decided, Edith remarked, stopping the swinging of her hammock with her foot, to write and ask Mr. Bonford to come and spend the weekend here. Burton shook his head. Please don't think of it, he begged. It would completely upset me. I should not be able to do another stroke of work. You and your work, Edith murmured, looking down at him. What about me? What is the use of being engaged if I may not have my fiancé come and see me sometimes? You don't want him, Burton declared confidently. But I do, she insisted, if only to stop your making love to me. I do not make love to you, he asserted. I am in love with you. There is a difference. But you ought not to be in love with me. You have a wife, she reminded him. A wife who lives at Garden Green does not count, he assured her. Besides, it was the other fellow who married her. She isn't really my wife at all. It would be most improper of me to pretend that she was. You are much too complicated a person to live in the same house with, she sighed. I shall do as I said. I shall ask Mr. Bonford down for the weekend. Then I shall go back to London, he pronounced firmly. 
A shadow fell across the grass. "'What's that? What's that?' the professor demanded, anxiously. They both looked up quickly. The professor had just put in one of his unexpected appearances. He had a habit of shuffling about in felt slippers, which were altogether inaudible. "'Miss Edith was speaking of asking a visitor, a Mr. Bomford, down for the weekend,' Burton explained suavely. "'I somehow felt that I should not like him. In any case, I have been here for a week, and I really ought—' "'Edith will do nothing of the sort,' the professor declared sharply. "'Do you hear that, Edith? No one is to be asked here at all. Mr. Burton's convenience is to be consulted before anyone's.' She yawned and made a face at Burton. "'Very well, father,' she replied meekly. "'Only I might just as well not be engaged at all.' "'Just as well,' the professor snapped. "'Such rubbish!' Edith swung herself upright in the hammock, arranged her skirts, and faced her father indignantly. "'How horrid of you!' she exclaimed. "'You know that I only got engaged to please you, because you thought that Mr. Bonford would take more interest in publishing your books. If I can't ever have him here, I shall break it off. He expects to be asked. I am quite sure he does.' The professor frowned impatiently. "'You are a most unreasonable child,' he declared. Mr. Bomford may probably pay us a passing visit at any time, and you must be content with that. Edith sighed. She contemplated the tips of her shoes for some moments. I do seem to be in trouble today, she remarked, first with Mr. Burton and then with you. The professor turned unsympathetically away. You know perfectly well how to keep out of it, he said, making his way towards the house. Between you both, Edith continued, I really am having rather a hard time. This is the last straw of all. I am deprived of my young man now, just to please you. He isn't a young man, Burton contradicted. Edith clasped her hands behind her head and looked fixedly up at the blue sky. Never mind his age, she murmured. He is really very nice. I've seen his photograph in the drawing room, Burton reminded her. Edith frowned. He is really much better looking than that, she said with emphasis. It is perhaps as well, Burton retorted, especially if he is in the habit of going about unattended. Edith ignored his last speech altogether. Mr. Bomford is also, she went on, extremely pleasant and remarkably well-read. His manners are charming. I am sorry you are missing him so much, Burton said. A girl, Edith declared with her head in the air, naturally misses the small attentions to which she is accustomed from her fiancé. If there is anything an unworthy substitute can do, Burton began. Nice girls do not accept substitutes for their fiancés, Edith interrupted ruthlessly. I am a very nice girl indeed. I think that you were very lazy this afternoon. You would be better employed at work than in talking nonsense. Burton sighed. I tried to work this morning, he declared. I gave up simply because I found myself thinking of you all the time. Genius is so susceptible to diversions. This afternoon I couldn't settle down because I was wondering all the time whether you were wearing blue linen or white muslin. I just looked out the window to see. You were asleep in the hammock. You witch, he murmured softly. How could I keep sane and collected? How could I write about anybody or anything in the world except you? The wind was blowing those little strands of hair over your face. Your left arm was hanging down. So, why is an arm such a graceful thing, I wonder? Your left knee was drawn up. You have been supporting a book against it, and— I don't want to hear another word, Edith protested quickly. He sighed. It took me about thirty seconds to get down, he murmured. You hadn't moved. Shall we have tea out here or in the study, Edith asked. Anywhere so long as we escape from this, Burton replied, gazing across the lawn. What is it? A man was making his way from the house towards him, a man who certainly presented a somewhat singular appearance. He was wearing a long linen duster, a motor cap which came over his ears, and a pair of goggles which he was busy removing. Edith swung herself onto her feet. Considering her late laments, the dismay in her tone was a little astonishing. It is Mr. Bomford, she cried. Burton sighed, with relief. I am glad to hear that it is human, he murmured. I thought that it was a Wells nightmare, or that something from underground had been let loose. She shot an indignant glance at him. Her greeting of Mr. Bomford was almost enough to turn his head. She held out both her hands. "'My dear mister, my dear Paul,' she exclaimed. "'How glad I am to see you. Have you motored down?' "'Obviously, my dear, obviously,' the newcomer remarked, removing further portions of his disguise and revealing a middle-aged man of medium height and unimposing appearance with slight sandy whiskers and mustache. "'A very hot and dusty ride, too. Still after your father's message, I did not hesitate for a second. Where is he, Edith? Have you any idea what it is that he wants? She shook her head. Did he send for you, she asked. Send for me, Mr. Bonford repeated. I should rather think he did. He looked inquiringly towards Burton. Edith introduced them. This, she said, is Mr. Burton, a friend of my father's who is staying with us for a few days. He is writing a book. Perhaps, if you are very polite to him, he will let you publish it. Mr. Bonford, Mr. Burton. The two men shook hands solemnly. Neither of them expressed any pleasure at the meeting. 
I am sure you would like a drink, Edith suggested. Let me take you up to the house and we can find father. You won't mind, Mr. Burton? Not in the least, he assured her. They disappeared into the house. Burton threw himself once more upon the lawn, his hands clasped behind his head, gazing upwards through the leafy boughs to the blue sky. So this was Mr. Bomford. This was the rival of whom he had heard. Not so very formidable a person, not formidable at all, save for one thing only. He was free to marry her, free to marry Edith. Burton lay and dreamed in the sunshine. A thrush came out and sang to him. A west wind brought him wafts of perfume from the gardens below. The serenity of the perfect afternoon mocked his disturbed frame of mind. What was the use of it all? The longer he remained here, the more abject he became. Suddenly Edith reappeared alone. She came across the lawn to him with a slight frown upon her forehead. He lay there and watched her until the last moment. Then he rose and dragged out a chair for her. "'So the lover's interview is over,' he ventured to observe. "'You do not seem altogether transported with delight.' "'I am very much pleased indeed to see Mr. Bomford,' she assured him. "'I,' he murmured, "'am glad that I have seen him.' Edith looked at him covertly. "'I do not think,' she said, "'that I quite approve of your tone this afternoon.' "'I am quite sure,' he retorted, "'that I do not approve of yours.' She made a little grimace at him. "'Let us agree, then, to be mutually dissatisfied. "'I do wish,' she added softly, "'that I knew why Father had sent for Mr. Bonford. "'It has nothing to do with his work, I am sure of that. "'He knows that Paul hates coming away from the office on weekdays.' "'Burton groaned. "'Is his name Paul?' "'Certainly it is,' she answered. "'It sounds very familiar.' "'It is nothing of the sort. "'When you are engaged to a person, "'you naturally call him by his Christian name. "'I can't think, though, "'why my father didn't tell us that he was coming.' "'I have an idea,' Burton declared, "'that his coming has something to do with me. "'With you? "'Why not? "'Am I not an interesting subject for speculation? "'Mr. Bomford, you told me only a few days ago, "'is a scientist, an Egyptologist, a philosopher. "'Why should he not be interested "'in the same things which interest your father?' It is quite true, she admitted. I had not thought of that. At the present moment, Burton continued, moving a little on one side, they are probably in the dining room drinking hock and seltzer, and your father is explaining to your fiancé the phenomenon of my experiences. I wonder whether he will believe them. Mr. Bomford, she said, will believe anything that my father tells him. Are you very much in love? Burton asked irreverently. You ask such absurd questions, she replied. Nowadays one is never in love. How little you know of what goes on nowadays, he sighed. What about myself? Do I need to tell you that I am hopelessly in love with you? You, she declared, are a phenomenon. You do not count. The professor and his guests came through the French window, arm in arm, talking earnestly. Look at them, Burton groaned. They are talking about me. I can tell it by their furtive manner. Mr. Bonford has heard the whole story. He is a little incredulous, but he wishes to be polite to his future father-in-law. What a pity that I could not have a relapse while he is here. Couldn't you, she explained. It would be such fun. Burton shook his head. Nothing but the truth, he declared sadly. Mr. Bonford, without his motoring outfit, was still an unprepossessing figure. He wore a pince-nez. His manner was fussy and inclined to be a little patronizing. He had the air of an unsuccessful pedagogue. He was obviously regarding Burton with a new interest. During tea-time he conversed chiefly with Edith, who seemed a little nervous and answered most of his questions with monosyllables. Burton and the professor were silent. Burton was watching Edith, and the professor was watching Burton. As soon as the meal was concluded, the professor rose to his feet. "'Edith, my dear,' he said, "'we wish you to leave us for a minute or two. "'Mr. Bomford and I have something to say to Mr. Burton.' Edith, with a slight shrug of the shoulders, rose to her feet. She caught a glance from Burton and turned at once to her fiancé. "'Am I to be taken for a ride this evening?' she asked. "'A little later on, by all means, my dear Edith,' Mr. Bomford declared. "'A little later on, certainly.' Your father has kindly invited me to stay and dine. It will give me very much pleasure. Perhaps we could go for a short distance in, say, three-quarters of an hour's time? Edith went slowly back to the house. Burton watched her disappear. The professor and Mr. Bomford drew their chairs a little closer. The professor cleared his throat. Mr. Burton, he began, Mr. Bomford and I have a proposition to lay before you. May I beg for your undivided attention? Burton withdrew his eyes from the French window through which Edith had vanished. I am quite at your service, he answered quietly. Please let me hear exactly what it is that you have to say. End of chapter 16 Recording by Joe Selah